There are two texts I would like to use this morning. The first is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And the second is in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, and 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. I'll read 1 Timothy 2 first, beginning in verse 9. Paul says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now if you'll turn with me to First Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And then it addresses further husbands and their responsibilities before God in the home. We will look more closely at 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. I think you get the idea that we're going to be examining modest apparel. <clears throat> now, this has always been a topic that should be addressed. It needs to be addressed in the pulpit and the classes the church teach, Bible classes. But I'll tell you the chief place it needs to be practiced and thereby exemplified and where the teaching and the training ought to be ought to be in the home it ought to be godly mamas and daddies teaching and practicing what's written here I think we don't realize or don't know why we don't but these things regarding modest apparel are just as binding on us as when to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week or the plan of salvation. This is just how Christians live, and specifically he's addressed the woman. Let me look at verses 8 and 9 of 1 Timothy 2, and I'll go back to that. I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up Holy hands like wrath and doubting. Then, he says, in like manner. Also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly away. Verse 10, but which become of the woman professing godliness with good works. Let me emphasize <clears throat> people, women, who are members of the church, the blood-bought body of Christ, who wear the name Christian, which means of Christ, profess godliness but I don't know anything about godliness but I don't know what God said about it if you go ask people out here what does it mean to be godly you get every kind of every kind of answer it would be like Jesus asking the disciples of the people of his day who do men say that I the son of man am and then they start telling me who they say that's where we are if we don't let the Bible be the final guide in determining these things Thus, I want to mention that when we talk about dress, there are a couple of things I want to bring out. 
Seeing that the Old Testament was written aforetime for our learning, Christians' learning, for we're under the New Testament of Christ, I think it's good that we understand something about the matter of what does it mean to be naked? What does it mean to be modest? So keep those points in mind as we go through this study. But specifically, verses 8 and 9, you'll notice a peril. A peril. It's from the Greek word katastole. It literally means a lowering, a letting down, hence a garment let down. So Thayer says in his Greek-English lexicon, a stole was simply a long robe of that day and time. The word modest, cosmio, simply means well-arranged, orderly. And the word modest suggests not the extreme on anything. Shamefastness or shamefacedness refers to a sense of shame, a proper reserve. That which prevents the shameful act, so Thayer declares. And then sobriety. It means good judgment. It means decency. It means self-control. It means being able to face the realities of life by bringing one in subjection to the truth of God as to how we ought to think, speak, and live. Now, if I stop here, then if you know anything, and I guess we do, about what's going on all around us and has been for years, it's just worse now and grows worse day by day, that is, not the acts themselves, but more people taking them and holding them in common and practicing them, that with the home falling to pieces and so much divorce and remarriage, the abdication of husbands from their role and wives from theirs and parents from theirs, children running every which way but loose, as that permeates more and more society like yeast permeates bread, then we expect to see it more and more a threat to the church and more than that, a threat to your family as to how you live a godly life. So I want you to keep those words in mind that the Holy Spirit had Paul use. Cut a stole and then stole itself in Cosmio. Now, Cosmio, you can hear it in Cosmetics. Cosmetics comes from Cosmio. Cosmos comes from Cosmio. Now, let me emphasize first of all that in this world anything goes. That is what you're trying, well, that's what you're being taught all around. Anything goes. People don't know how to think in the light of the truth because they don't know the truth. They have no interest in God or Christ. They do as they please. But notice we're not to underdress. Underdress. We're not to be naked, gumnos, which literally means uncovered. Now, I want to have the biblical definition of naked. Most of the time nowadays we say that person was naked in our mind or somebody there without a stitch on. But that's not necessarily the definition the Holy Spirit used when it comes to uncovered or naked. Literally, Thayer says naked describes one unclad or ill-clad. That's, that's an interesting idea today. Or in an undergarment only. Back in Job chapter 22, 6, Scripture reads, For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, for nothing, and stripped the naked of their clothing. That doesn't just necessarily mean then somebody took somebody's clothes right off down to the bare flesh. But it means naked as God says you're naked. Then in James 2, 15 through 16, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, 
what doth it profit? You know, a person with some food can still be destitute, and a person with some clothing can still be naked. Because I must know, if I care about God's will and His understanding of things and what I'm here on this earth to do and getting ready for the day I die and stand before Him in judgment, then I'm concerned about His view and definition of all things, and especially when it comes to modest apparel and naked. I want to talk about not being shameless. Shameless. Shameless is almost a word, or shame itself. It doesn't exist nowadays. People don't have much shame about them. Scripture says concerning Noah after the flood that he had become drunken, that he was uncovered in his tent, Genesis 9, 21, through the rest of the time, the chapter there. If you turn over to Isaiah, the great messianic prophecy, as he's speaking to Babylon, he says, Take millstones and grind meat and cover thy locks. Make bare the leg uncover the thigh pass over the rivers now watch thy nakedness shall be uncovered yea thy shame shall be seen I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man so we see in that prophecy as he applies these things to the uh, the uh, sinning people of God we get an idea of how they viewed nakedness and to Judah Jeremiah had this to say. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 6.15. In the little book of Nahum, chapter 3 and verse 5, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame. Then we read in the last book of the Bible, in the New Testament, Revelation 3.18, he addresses this church, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Again, I do not look at nakedness as we say today. I want to look at it through God's eyes as revealed in the Scriptures as to His definition of nakedness. When you go back to the beginning and Adam and Eve sinned and they became aware of the fact that they weren't naked, left to their own devices and counsel, they sewed fig leaves together and made them aprons, that was what they knew to do. But have you ever noticed when God came in their presence that uh, they still were ashamed and they hid themselves from God? What they decided to do to cover themselves in those aprons of fig leaves was insufficient. And the Lord, in Genesis 3.21, the Scripture reads, made them coats of skins and clothed them. It's interesting to read the Hebrew there. <clears throat> those cloaks of skins covered from the shoulder all the way down to the knees. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. That's at the beginning of the Bible period, and there's a definition in the description into the words that's used in describing the coats of skins and how those coats of skins clothed them and what parts of the body were covered on Adam and Eve. In Luke 8, 35, where the Lord had healed the man with many demons, after his healing, it says this. They found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. He was naked before that. Luke 8, 35 and other verses there. Now, if we go back again to the Old Testament, keeping in mind what we saw right in the very beginning of things when Moses wrote about the creation and man's sin, I became ashamed because of that sin and what he had left his own devices, clothed themselves, that was insufficient with God and what God did to clothe them. We learned that when the law of Moses was given, in that law there were the instructions to the priest. All the priests came to the tribe of Levi. And there was this said in Exodus 28, and verse 2, breaches, that's what it calls them, 
It says, they shall extend from the hips to the thighs. And it says that was to cover their nakedness. But that's not all. In Exodus 28, verse 39, they had a priestly tunic. And it covered the entire body from the neck to the feet. And it had sleeves on it that reached completely down to the wrists. Now, I've often said, and you know it, we must take all of what the Bible says on a given subject before we try to reason with it and draw a correct conclusion. Well, I've taken that which was written before time for our learning, and I've noticed what is said in the New Testament that governs us as to what is modesty. I've tried to form what the biblical definition of nakedness is and what the biblical definition of being clothed is. And I think I've said this before, but I guess it'll always stick in my mind because it came from my maternal great-grandfather. And it's a little bit of the terminology used in the bygone day that nobody would use anymore. But in describing a certain person in his day and time, he said she didn't have enough clothes on to wad a shotgun. Well, that goes back to black powder days. It doesn't take much to put wadding in the end of a barrel or ramrod at home. Well, nowadays, uh, if you ask the average person out here on the street what nakedness is, and especially if you were to ask them what covering your nakedness means, I don't know what you're going to hear. I heard one person say one time that his definition of nakedness was if a woman had on one of these string bikinis, she was not naked. But if she was in the presence of so someone that had on a standard size bathing suit, she would be naked. Now, if there was an example of subjective thinking and relativism, there it is. The Bible is an objective standard. When you understand it, it is absolute and binding on everybody pertaining to who it was addressed to. So when you consider the priests themselves, then they had these breeches, and they were, they, their underpants, we would call them today. And it was designed so that they went up and down those steps nobody could see under the skirts, so their nakedness wouldn't appear. Well, you know, that's in complete harmony when you look at the rest of the priest's garments, besides just showing the holiness and dignity of their office under the law of Moses. And you go back to how God, in his infant wisdom, clothed Adam and Eve. In other words, when he, he put that coat on made of animal skins, he could now stand back and say, now you're clothed. Your nakedness doesn't appear. And so we need to understand that somebody ought to be ashamed of himself to go around with what is acceptable today. And people would say, well, they're clothed. We talked about last week, if any man speak, let him speak the oracles of God. Well, that covers nakedness, the meaning of it, being clothed, the meaning of it, and what modest dress is. Look at the word chaste, because we're women are dressed to be chaste. Now, I guess I ought to interject this here parenthetically. People get the idea that only women can be immodest. Well, that's just not true. <laughs> But when you look at these uh, statements I read, they were addressed, especially in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. They were addressed to the women. Uh, Timothy was to preach this. The church needed to know it. People need to practice it and need to teach it to one another. I will say this about women as to the reason they were created according to the inspired Genesis and the way they are built. It's more easily, more easy for a woman to be immodest than it is for a man. And she needs to be mindful of that. She needs to know what God made her to do and to be and how she should look. And thus you will see some of these things will make more sense because remember we read Peter talking about women professing godliness. So one thing I'll say here again is this. We're talking about a state of mind. We're talking about an attitude that permeates the life. We're seeing too already that this does not just uh, have to do with something 
clothing that's very tight and too tight or too little of it. But it also has to do with the kind of stuff you wear. We'll say more about that a little later. But I'm talking about the word C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste. Now the young preacher, Titus, Titus 2, verses 4 through 5, Paul addressed. He says, older women are to teach the younger women. Now this is a taught thing, folks. I wish you'd realize all of Christianity is a taught thing. People have to be taught it. It doesn't just fall out of the air on them. It must be exemplified by godly parents. They must put it into practice. They must teach. They must train. Teaching is imparting the knowledge. Training is seeing they do it. So they're to be sober. You can teach soberness. To love their husbands, yes. You can teach young wives how to love their husbands. To love their children, do you think a lot of women need to be taught how to love their children? To be discreet, chaste, there's a word. And here's one that'll get you thrown out on your ear. Keepers at home, Titus 2, 4 through 5. I said this morning in our study of some things in Titus that Hollywood and those who love that kind of thing are against everything that Paul wrote here. The same is true in this. Hollywood does not teach anybody to be sober-minded or to women to love their husbands or to love their children or to be discreet or to be chaste or to be keepers at home. It teaches right the opposite of that. So many people fall victim to this, and the church like a boat's in the water. So the church in the world, and we let too much of the world get into the church, and when that happens, the church ceases to be the church God wants it to be. But more than that, the home where these things are cease to be what God wants them to be. Now, chaste simply means pure. It means innocent. It means abstaining. We sang a song a moment ago. It said, pure, oh, God, help me to be. Let's start the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If you're not pure in heart, as the Bible defines that pureness, then you will not be with God when you die. Matthew 18, 6, you can go and read some more verses around that, but specifically verse 6. But whosoever offendeth one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. I read even further in Matthew 5, 28, or we actually go back here in Matthew. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her committed adul- hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Think that's taught much around the country? Right the opposite. But notice what Peter had to say to Christians regarding their state of mind, how they should be seeing things in 2 Peter 2, 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. You think that's a problem in this nation? And then Paul writing to Christians in the churches of Galatia originally, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, speaking of the works of the flesh. And in that list, the works of the flesh, he uses the word lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. He says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The other things listed there, but I'm centering in on lasciviousness. Lasciviousness translates to a Greek word, asalagia. And it denotes unbridled lust, wanton manners. <clears throat> Seems to me thus far, if I were to stop here and say, what do you see encouraged in this country? Over the television? Over the internet? Over Hollywood long ago? Many, many different magazines and books. Folks, in modest dress just doesn't appeal only to those who have filthy minds. Sometimes people will say that as if a woman can dress or undress any way she wants to, and if the other person has the right kind of mind, it won't make them any difference. That's just not true. Bathsheba's appearance caused David to lust, and the Bible still says of him, he was a man after God's own heart. Acts thirteen twenty two. Well, he should have had his mind in the right place. A lot of things he should have done. 
But David was not somebody in his day and time under the law of Moses who set his heart just to gratify every appetite of the flesh possible. Can't say that about Solomon, his son. Can't about David. Here's one of the wonders of David. When he's confronted with all this mess that he started because he let his lust get away from him, Bathsheba wouldn't say no to the king. And what was she doing? Taking a bath on top of the house, right where the king could look and see. Takes two, folks, not just one. But when he was confronted about that matter, he did what most will not do. He said, I have sinned. That's the difference with him and a host of folks. That's the reason he's a man after God's own heart. A person after God's own heart, it's not that he never sins. The Bible's full of material to teach you that man doesn't reach a stage of not sinning. But when confronted with the fact you did sin, you can see exactly why David is held up as he is in the Bible. You know, all is sin to come short of the glory of God, so there's no use talking about what if there's a person out here that doesn't sin. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and 6.23. The question is, what are we going to do about our sins when we see them? Whether it's becoming a Christian, and we're still alienated from God by our sins we first committed. Or if we become a Christian, and here's what's involved in growing up to be more like Christ, then we neglected areas. We let ourselves slide. And there's a host of brethren, especially now, that pay no attention to how they dress, where they go, who they go with, the influence they have on others. If I were to say, do you think going out to the water park over here or to a public swimming hole, do you think that's, uh, well, I just ask it since it was applied as Peter did to women in the church, do you think that says the women there of professing godliness. I think not. Well, why were members of the church? You're a Christian. You're of Christ. You're under his authority. You don't act without his authority. He's your savior. Nobody else can. But he's also your judge. And he will judge you in the light of the truth of the New Testament. James 1, verse 25. John 12, verse 48. But let's look at this for a moment, a little further. 1 Timothy 2, and verse 9. Talking about the braided hair. Women are to do that. A popular luxury in those days, it represented their fortunes as to how rich they wanted people to know they were. They would even have take hours to weave gold into their hair, and they fastened by jewel tortoise shells and combs or pins of ivory or silver, what it was precious indicative of your status and wealth in your life. There were other pens of bronze with miniature images such as animals or humans or a human hand or an idol or a female figure. And he says, or gold. Don't be extravagant. Or pearls. They had to go all the way to the Persian Gulf to get these things in the Indian Ocean. It cost a lot to have those things. And you can see how our Lord used that in Matthew 13, 46, and how much we should want to find the kingdom when he said a merchant might sell his entire stock to obtain one of them, and that's what he did. And we should have that attitude toward learning the truth and living it. Or he says, costly array. Potutelli, which means very expensive or fabulously priced. Why, why say this? Does that mean that a woman can never wear a bracelet on her arm or whatever. Don't you see that he's saying you don't bedeck yourself as people who have no knowledge of God and who live on the level of the appetite of the flesh and who want to be known for whatever they are by the things of this present world. You can see that kind of thing when Jesus warned in Mark 12 and verse 38, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing. Well, long clothing, we can probably Covered everything up, it ought to be covered. But what do they mean? They were advertising themselves on how pious we are, how righteous we are, when in reality they weren't. And we're warned not to be partial toward those in goodly apparel, James 2, verses 1 through 5. 
Don't we understand that he's saying the Christian woman, in fact, no Christian does, bedecks themselves or dresses in such a way as to focus on the outward, to focus on what is pleasing to the world. We're to be mindful of good works as the Bible defines good works. That's what Christians do. We're to be ready into every good work. And when it comes to women, he talks about in verse 10 of adorning themselves in good works, that which becometh, that means it suits or it befits them for what they are. As I've said several times already, as Peter said, women professing godliness. Now, let me say this further. To pronounce or to profess is to announce concerning oneself is to, to promise. And you have in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. It's simply saying people see you and you draw their attention either to somebody who is godly in their attitude, their appearance, and their conduct. Or you look like some clown that's been to Hollywood and had somebody dress you. Have you noticed, surely you have, that the modern view of being well-dressed is basically dressed like a street walker plying her trade. But Christians are to profess their Christianity by the good works, the things they do. Uh, what did Dorcas look like and what kind of clothes did she wear? Do you remember what the widow said? They came showing Peter all the things she had made for the widows, the good work she had involved herself in in her station in life. That's what they're remembering. They don't say all those things the world chimes into. <laughs> Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plait. Don't put the emphasis on the outward. Plaiting the hair, wearing of gold, putting on the apparel. Well, what's to shine forth? Notice. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. And that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Which is in the sight of God, great price. 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4. Well, surely that means when you do this, you'll be different from the person who cares not for God nor the church, no living like the Bible says. There's a contrast drawn here. One builds to the spirit dominating the flesh, the other to the flesh dominating the spirit. Now, is it wrong to wear jewelry, a wedding ring, style the hair? No, no, no. You missed the whole point Paul's making in 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. He's putting the positive for the comparative, the thought is emphasize good works and not outward clothing and apparel. Now, compare John 6, 27, where Jesus said, Labor not for the meat, the food, the sustenance, which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Well, nothing wrong with eating. So he's not saying it's wrong to eat. He's talking about don't put the emphasis there. Don't put the emphasis on the affairs of this life. Don't let these things dominate your plans and purposes for yourself and what you're here for, for the brief time you're here. For life is as a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Laboring for physical food then is not inherently sinful any more than certain jewelry is not inherently or innately sinful, evil. But in both cases, spiritual is more important, and that's done, that's emphasized by comparison. Just one of the way the Bible teaches. Women, particularly, tend to dress according to the fashions of society, whatever that is. But Paul says, be not fashioned. Fashioned according to this world, Romans 12, verse 1, American Standard Version. But here's the way you ought to dress. It ought to reflect who you are, your character, your godliness. Now, the world is, doesn't have any idea about what I'm talking about. What I preached to you this morning, 
be even strange in some churches. But you have control of yourself, or you ought to, and you can bring your life in subjection to these truths, or you can neglect them. You can let your kids go ahead and go naked to the swimming pool. And folks, biblically, they are naked because they don't follow the clothing as it's described in the scriptures and the way the Bible defines nakedness. Contemporary culture certainly plays a part in determining our dress. I know that. But there's a point to which you cannot pass with simply not showing yourself as a worldly person. We're taught to provide things honest in the sight of all men, Romans 12, 17. Therefore, we must look around us. and We don't want to jump off into things like that if we're going to serve God and keep his commandments. There's just no other way around it. I don't think this lesson has been difficult. It's just pointed out things that are in your Bible all along. We don't go by the same standard of the world. We're taught, be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, Exodus 23, 2. So the judgment of mature Christians is a better initial guide. Them that are full, full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, Hebrews 5, 14. And then he says, as Paul did, the aged women, that they may teach the young women, Titus 2, 4, and 5. So there's where we are. I realize people may have many questions that might arise from a study like this, but we can't cover everything. But believe it or not, I think we covered enough to make people sit up and take notice and cause us to reflect on our own lives. Are we, whether man or woman, are we living in such a way that our lives profess godliness as the Bible defines godliness? And then are we studying the Bible to learn about that? Well, the first step, if you're not a Christian, is to become one. The Bible teaches that belief in Jesus Christ is essential. You can't go to heaven and not believe he's the Son of God. John 8, verse 24. Now, if you believed in Christ, that he's the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you must then repent of your sins. Right there is where the rubber meets the road, Acts 17, 30. To repent is to turn your whole up life upside down as far as the world's concerned. To turn yourself completely around from the inside out to embrace the truth, reject everything that's been contrary to it, and you resolve in your mind, I'm going to live the rest of my life this way. Then to confess one's faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, and to complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. But as a child of God, now how have we been living? What kind of example are we setting? How are we working at rearing our own children and training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? What all that involved? Are you a modest-minded person? If you are, you're letting the Bible define that term modesty. Then you will be that outwardly. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.